Hi folks, I've been a licensed amateur radio operator for some 40 years now, but in recent years I've been pretty much inactive on the ham bands, preferring to monitor the shortwave broadcast bands instead. But there has been one thing that has dragged me back to work in the ham bands again, and that is the FT8 uh, digital weak signal mode. In fact, my first FT8 contact was made almost 12 months ago on April the 8th, 2018. And since that time, I've uh, knocked up more than 1,600 QSOs on FT8. Now, that's certainly not as many as some people, um, some of whom have many thousands of QSOs over the same period. But for me, 1,600 is more QSOs in 12 months than I'd made in, in the previous 15 years. So that's certainly something. And uh, there have been a few things that I've learned uh, about it along the way over the past year. So uh, I'm using this time to uh, sort of reflect on my first year of using FT8. Um, if, you've ex if you're an experienced uh, digital operator out there, now there may not be anything that you would consider earth shattering here, what I'm going to say, but that's okay. See if my observations match your own. So here are my 15 observations on FT8. I am one of a minority of WSJTX users that use the Apple Mac OS X operating system. Now I can report that it works great and any issues that I had in setting up the software related mostly to hardware issues rather than the software on the operating system. On my uh, Yaesu FTDX3000 I used the CAT control and the sound card in the transceiver so there's, there's no need for uh, an external interface in my shack. There is a known uh, issue however on a few Apple Mac machines uh, to do with intermittent problems with the USB bus. Now I was one that did have that issue and eventually got around the problem by connecting my transceiver through the Thunderbolt port instead of the USB port. The Thunderbolt 2 dock from Otherworld Computing really helped here to uh, get us going. You may hear from some users that if your transceiver registers any ALC action, this will cause a distorted transmitted signal. Now this information is not completely accurate. Some transceivers require at least a little ALC in order to transmit a signal. My FT uh, DX3000 is one of those. Initially I got hung up about having any movement of the ALC meter based on what others were saying. But further research confirmed what I had found in my own situation, that a reasonable amount of ALC in some transceivers is necessary. So the operation of the ALC does depend on which rig you are using. So this is something that individual operators need to check out on their own gear. When using FT8, preamps, noise blankers and the AGC should, in most situations, preferably be in the off position. However, I found that in the uh, 10 and 15 metre bands, where band noise and signals are often at a low level, then I can occasionally use the first stage preamp on my FTDX3000, uh, which is called the uh, Intercept uh, Point Optimization, or IPO, and this can sometimes assist in better reception on those higher frequencies. The notch filter can be a really handy tool for blocking out that plus 20 dB signal from another very strong local amateur station. While it will also potentially block out other weaker signals operating very near that frequency of the song, strong signal, it does mean that you don't have to wind back the RF gain quite that much for that particular station. On many rigs, the width of the notch filter is adjustable so on a narrow setting it can be extremely effective, especially when using uh, FT8 signals that have a bandwidth of less than 50 Hz. When you have a band full of signals with a wide variety of signal strengths, I find that I get good results if I ride the RF gain control. Continually adjusting the RF gain allows me to create the best opportunity to successfully decode signals of different strengths. In fact, 
when I first started out on FT8, I tended to have the RF gain way too high, thinking that more was better. I quickly learned that this was not the case, and can indeed create problems when very strong signals are present, causing the computer's sound card to reproduce that signal in different parts of the waterfall. Now, if you have a strong signal reproducing itself on the waterfall, don't assume that that's the fault of the other guy's transmitter. There's a better than even money chance that your RF gain is too high to cope with that strong signal. Indeed, I've been amazed at times at just how low I can get the RF gain and still successfully decode signals in, across the band. Don't regard the FT8 waterfall as an accurate representation of another ham operator's signal quality. The waterfall is not a spectrum analyzer or a pan adapter and should not be used or interpreted as such. It is simply a visual uh, reference or mechanism for displaying where all the signals are spread out across the waterfall. It's a useful guide for finding vacant spots on the band for you to transmit and locating the other guy's uh, signal, but don't use it for determining signal quality. As my old eyes get older, I find the font size on WSJTX too small, especially when the receive window is full of call signs. If you have the same problem, just look under the General tab on the uh, FT8 Preferences and uh, click on Font and Decoded Font and have a play around with the font types and sizes. For some of us, it can make life easier on the old eyes. In the same vein, try changing around the colours of the decode highlighting. The default colour scheme is quite good for my eyes, although I find that the My Call in Message default colour uh, was a little dark to, uh, to read the text easily. Right-clicking on the highlighting brings up choices for both foreground and background colours, and the little palette window allows you to, to make some small changes there. I just brightened up uh, a little the My Call in Message highlight colour, which made all the difference. I also slightly modified the New Call in Band blue alert, because I found that the default colour was a little too close to the richer blue of the New Call alert. Obviously this is personal choice, so you can just get a chance to play around with that. It's worth doing. Okay, so what else have I learned? Well, we're up to number nine. The noise floor matters. <laughs> it really does. Uh, you have, if you hear a strong station and you answer is CQ call, but you just can't seem to get through. Obviously, there could be a number of reasons for this, but one which some of us forget is that the station you are trying to contact may have a much higher noise level at his location, and your signal may not be breaking through the noise. Remember that the signal-to-noise reports exchanged in a QSO are relative to the noise floor at the receive location. Now this might seem I'm stating the bleeding obvious, but I suspect that sometimes we forget this when using digital modes. Working split really helps. Here at the bottom end of southeastern Australia, I often get multiple stations responding to my CQ on my frequency. On those occasions, I often don't get any decodes from any of those trying to call me. Yet, if we all spread out, I have a fighting chance at seeing multiple decodes which I can usually handle and respond to in order. Sometimes, I have trouble completing a QSO on the frequency where I initially started the contact. Indeed, the station you are working may well be struggling to decode your next over due to interference or noise levels at his end. There is nothing sacred about sitting on the same frequency in order to complete the QSO. Uh, I have often been able to complete a QSO under difficult circumstances 
by uh, switching to other frequencies that may potentially be clearer for the station at the other end. So it's worth a try. But sometimes, no matter what frequency you choose, uh, even after many attempts, you still can't complete the QSO. So despite what I said in number 10 about working split, occasionally, uh, in desperation, I have also been able to complete a QSO with a strong station by jumping on his frequency to close out the QSO. Now my theory here is that if he is a very strong signal for me, then perhaps he is a strong signal at other locations as well. In which case, other hams may uh, possibly be avoiding his frequency as well. In which case, his frequency may well be the best place to go. I guess it's a case of if all else fails. The ionosphere is always in a state of flux, constantly changing every minute. I think this is no more obvious than when using weak signal propagation modes such as FT8 and the like. Even within a two minute QSO, I've noticed signals come and go rapidly. I've always been interested in propagation, so I find observing these propagation changes and conditions in FT8 quite, quite fascinating. And indeed, we can see these changes become more obvious with the help of useful tools such as PSK Reporter, WhisperNet, and, and Hamspots.net. I have these three online tools open on the desktop every time I use both FT8 and Whisper modes. Observing propagation of these weak signal modes has definitely helped me better understand the nature of the ionosphere. FT8, Whisper and the other digital modes have shown to be resilient in, in times of poor propagation conditions. The success in being able to cut through with completed QSOs at times when conditions are terrible using forward error correction methods and such has really helped uh, the popularity of these modes in amateur radio. My output power is usually between 5 and 40 watts. When the conditions are good and the prop is running really well, I have long strings of QSOs to the US, Japan and elsewhere using just 5 watts into a humble dipole. Indeed, this is possible pretty regularly in my evenings here on uh, 7 megahertz between about 0900 and 1200 UTC which is around 7 to 10 p.m. local time here. Sure, I could use 100 watts or more to make the same QSOs, but geez, I just get a buzz out of doing it at 5 watts or less. Finally, number 15. When not using FT8 or the other JT modes, why not leave your rig running on Whisper? Being a late convert to the digital modes, I've only just recently discovered the value of Whisper in, in uh, checking and testing my antennas, uh, making antenna comparisons and checking current propagation conditions. It's really great to see that some hams are still using Whisper regularly. Don't just forget about it. It can provide a valuable service to others, as well as giving you important information on your own station setup. So there you go, 15 reflections, observations, comments, call them what you like, on my FT8 experiences over the past year. There are other comments I could make, but I think that's quite enough for one video. It's been fun and I've really enjoyed uh, this digital mode. In fact, I've had to uh, print up some new QSL cards because of FT8, and for those guys who have been kindly sending me their cards in the, in the mail. While I'm on Logbook of the World, EQSL, QRZ, it's still nice to receive the occasional paper card in the mail, and I always make sure to reply with my card too. Okay, so that's enough for now. Thanks for watching, and please call me if you hear me on FT8. 73, and good DX to you all.